Hey, thanks for joining me today for episode number 77 of Podcasting Your Brand. I'm your host, producer Jemmy, providing learning lessons for you to podcast your brand. And today, I'm going to bring you my next podcasting 102 topic, protecting your assets, what to copyright versus what to trademark. And I'm joined by my pro podcasting peer guest, Gordon Firemark, also known as The podcast lawyer. And this episode is brought to you by my own brand, Flintstone Media. So listen in and let's do this first by starting with one of my daily tips. Hey, it's producer Jemmy here with a quick tip for the day. So I actually just got done recording an episode of the Owl app and Owl, Owl podcast. And that brought to mind my tip for you today. You always want to make sure you check your sound. Do an equipment check, a sound check, a tech check before you get started. We did that today and we had to overcome a little bit of an issue. What was the issue? Um, Producer Jemmy forgot her laptop at home. So we had to bring in another laptop, another recording software, da da da. But then we had to check all the things. So imagine if we had hit record and uh, with the first piece of software we tried to use and we recorded nothing because we didn't check first. That's what would have happened because the first software we tried to use recorded nothing. (laughs) So always do a sound check, check your mics, your headphones, your equipment, your recorder, all the things before you get started. More daily tips for you every day at podcastingyourbrand.com is producer Jemmy. All right. So be sure that you're following me on TikTok, Instagram, Clapper, YouTube, basically all the social media. So you get all of my daily tips and you get them first for anybody else does. <laughs> you get them first if you follow me on social media. So be sure that you do. And I also want to let you know that there's an opportunity to work in a small group setting live with me in some workshops. So if you're launching a show, you can take my launch workshop. Or if you want to take your show that you already have to the next level, you can take my podcast maximization workshop. So both of those can be found at toppodcastworkshop.com. You can work with me live. It's so much fun. Okay. So I want to get to today's lesson. No, but before we do, I want to explain the gap (laughs) from last week real quick. Okay. So some of you may know, but not everybody. Some of you may know that I have a lung condition. All right. So my right lung got injured back in 2000, summer 2000, and it's never been the same. Long story short, when I get sick, if it gets into my lung, it causes basically one sided pneumonia and it's extremely painful. And I'm coughing constantly. My body gets exhausted. It's awful. And so what happens is even though I recorded this with Gordon back on, I think, May 3rd, like it's been banks. (laughs) It has been ready and available. But because I was in so much pain and just really feeling awful, I knew I wasn't going to be able to promote this episode properly. So rather than put it out there and then have nothing else happen and be completely quiet about it, I just thought I'd save it because it is such an important episode. I didn't want it to be overlooked. So I saved it for today. And also I learned over the years when my lung gets like that, when it gets really bad like it was, I just need to give myself the grace and space to recover. So that is what I did. But I'm back in the lab for you today. Super excited to keep this podcasting your brand train going because I want to help you build your brand through the power of podcasting. So on today's topic, let's let's get into today's lesson because one of the constant motivators for me for the last like nine years of producing shows, hosting shows, of creating podcast networks, one of my constant motivators is allowing people to empower their voices. And that also means owning their voices. And for you, that means protecting your podcast content. So how do we do that? Well, Gordon is going to help us get all those questions answered today as we talk about what to copyright versus what to trademark with the podcast lawyer himself, Gordon Firemark. Well, welcome, Gordon Firemark, to the show. I am so excited to have you, first of all, because I adore you, known you for a while, and I think you're great, but also because I appreciate how much you have given to us as podcasters, trying to fake it till we make it like we know what we're doing and building something and doing it the right way. And that can mean equipment, concepts, and content, and all that stuff, but it also means the legalities of it. So... I have been dying to have you on and talk to my listeners about some of these legalities. And first of all, I want to tell my listener that if and you'll give a share where at the end people can contact you, but you want to stay around for the information because Gordon is the legal legal of the podcast 
roofing industry. So you definitely want to to stick around so you can hear how to contact him directly. But Gordon, tell us a little bit about why you've you've cornered this industry and why this looking at the legality of podcasting has been so interesting to you and how you've gotten the niche of the foothold. Well, first of all, Jimmy, thank you for having me on. And let me just say the, the feeling is mutual. We have a little mutual adoration yeah. society going on. So that's wonderful. Um, my, so I'm Gordon Firemark. They call me the podcast lawyer and I am a, uh, uh, I've been practicing law for about 30 years doing mostly entertainment law, entertainment media and business law. And so when I started podcasting myself in the late, well, early 2000s, I guess you could say, uh, I, realized that there wasn't any legal resources for podcasters particularly. So I sat down to figure it out for myself, you know, scratch your yeah. own itch. And I wrote a book called The Podcast Blog and New Media Producers Legal Survival Guide. And that sort of, you know, you write a book, you become an expert pretty quickly. And uh, that has propelled me into the into this arena in a big way. And I just love to share my knowledge and share information so that podcasters and other content creators can get the word out, get their message out and have the impact they desire without getting into the kinds of hot water and quicksand that they can if they're not careful. So absolutely. So I don't know if you, actually, I don't know if you know this about me, but I, I've been to law school. Uh, I, so I went to, I didn't oh. just go for a visit and say hi. I mean, I actually attended law school. <laughs> <laughs> and and that put the fear of God in me about contracts and just, you know, protecting your content. So as I've been becoming a podcaster, helping other people become podcasters, this has always been present of mind. So there's could be there could be a lot that we could dive into, you know, release forms for guests, uh, disclosures for sponsorships, all kinds of things. This is going to be the basics. Sure. <laughs> the basics. <laughs> we are going to start with copyright and trademark because they're so important in terms of protecting your content and that has to be out of everything the thing that I f treasure most closely to my heart independence be able to protect their content so let's first define copyright and trademark and say why they're so important Gordon if you could please okay sure so copyright is a form of protection where where the law gives authors and inventors in the case of patents but in copyright it's authors of creative works as long as it's original and it's fixed in some tangible form, it gives a set of exclusive rights to that author, the, the right to make copies and distribute them, to perform a work in public or display it, and the right to make things based on or derived from the original can work. I, wait, not and to so, interrupt you, but yeah. can I just tell you, I am today years old when I realized that copyright meant you had the right to copy. Okay, continue, please. <laughs> <laughs> I was today years old. Well, yeah. When I put that and, together, and, oh my gosh. So, so what that means, exclusive <laughs> right, means nobody else is allowed to do it without your permission. And that makes for a way, uh, at least the idea of the law is that it, it creates a way to incentivize the act of creation. Because if I, if I control that right, then I can get paid from people who want to use the stuff so I've true. created. So that's copyright. And that's the reason why if you want to use someone else's you know, music or poem or something mm -hmm. like that, you've got to get the permission because those authors or the owners that they've transferred things to own those exclusive rights. <laughs> I have a feeling the, the question of can I use so-and-so's copywritten music has, has come up a lot for you, Gordon. <laughs> we'll get into that. I'm what sure. time is it? <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> The trademark on the other side is about brands, you know, a distinctive symbol or word or phrase or something that is applied to goods or services. In this case, the title of a podcast can be applied to the service of the entertainment as well as the, the downloadable audio file, which is the, the goods side of it. And, 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 um, when one adopts a distinctive brand like that, um, one owns the right to essentially stop others from making confusingly similar brands. And if you think about it, trademark and brand are sort of synonymous with each other. If you think about it in the old West, you know, you would sear the symbol for the ranch onto a mm -hmm. cow's hide. A distinctive symbol applied to goods or services to tell you where it came from. Right, right. Because so, that cow got up. <laughs> yeah. So that title of your show becomes your brand. And if it's distinctive, and that is no other shows with it with the same title, you can restrict other people's ability to do that. It's not as simple as copyright, which comes into effect the moment you create the work. You have to adopt the brand and then sort of defend it pretty 
pretty rigorously and and file registrations and things. But it's a uh, uh, it's a, a nice suite of protections for creators. Sure. So, okay, let me just kind of break it down to basic nuts and bolts for some for, yep. for the listeners. So, uh, show art would be more protected by trademark, correct? It could okay. be both. The tra- the show art is certainly it's an artistic work of creative expression. So there could be a copyright. There is copyright protection in any original mm-hmm. show art. But to the extent that it now becomes the identity of your podcast, it is also a brand. Another great example is Mickey Mouse is a, a copyrighted character, but he's also the symbol of the Walt Disney Company. Right. Now, what's interesting about Mickey is that at the end of this year, December 31st, 2023, is the end of Mickey's life as a copyright protected character. Oh my gosh. Let's see what happens with all of that. <laughs> 2024 could be an interesting year. Well, I mean, we, we may see other Mickey Mouse stories and yeah. cartoons and, and things like that, yeah. but they won't be they won't be Disney. Right. There's lots of so fandom that's... stuff made on YouTube or whatnot. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> that's interesting. Okay. You might have heard that earlier this year there was a a Winnie the Pooh horror movie. Because Winnie the Pooh is in the public. Oh, now, my so. gosh. So he crossed over before Mickey. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So that's the thing. Copyrights last for a limited time, but mm-hmm. it's a very long, limited time. I think the Happy Birthday song was recently outgrew it, right? There was a lot of litigation about the Happy Birthday song because it was originally apparently written in the 1860s or something like that. But a music publishing company came along in the 1920s or 30s and did a rearrangement of it and so on. And they, they claimed ownership of it for years and years. And then finally a documentary filmmaker actually went uh, and let them take them to court over it by not licensing it. And uh, after years of litigation, the, the courts have determined, nope, it is not protected by copyright anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in the clear to sing yeah. happy birthday. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Good, good, good to know. Now everybody could check that mark off your list. So, right. all right. So what do, what do we need to protect with our own copyright as, as our well, podcasters creating our stuff and going through the process. If we want to be careful, what should we protect with copyright? Well, the good news is the protection exists. The moment you create the work, the moment yeah. you, re- you know, record the show or, or draw the picture or paint the painting or whatever you own those rights, the copyright rights that I talked about. There is a mechanism for registration. That is a good idea, mm-hmm, but it mm-hmm. is not required in order to be protected. It is required if you're in the U S if you're going to file a lawsuit against somebody for infringement, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but the, the cost of registration is significant enough that most people are not registering every single episode of their show or something. Right. Um, if you have cornerstone content, I think it makes good sense to do it. If you certainly, if you're assembling it all into a compilation or a book or something like that, it makes sense to register those. But, uh, yeah, there's a, it's a cost benefit analysis for that. Mm-hmm. Um, beyond protecting it that way, you've got to be a little vigilant. If you own intellectual property of any kind, copyright or trademark, and you find other people out there using it, you need to try to put a stop to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, with copyright, if it's online stuff, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA takedown procedure can be your friend. You can send a notice to the internet service provider that is hosting the content. So that would probably be the media host for a podcaster. Somebody's using your stuff. You can send a notice and say, Hey, that's mine. Make them stop. Yeah. And then they have, I think about 48 hours to actually take it down and, and and then sort of let the two parties duke it out. And then that way the service provider doesn't get sued. So you can get a copyright to protect your own stuff. And then if you Mm -hmm. see, you just have to be vigilant, watch for any infringements and then send, you know, cease and desist letter or something of that nature to tell them yeah. to stop and to take it down. But then I'm curious, especially as we mentioned music a moment ago, how do you yeah. be sure that you don't violate someone else's copyright? There are times I've heard court cases where a musician's brought in and said, someone accuses them of, they basically stole my melody. But the yeah. question is, did they steal their melody or did they come up with it originally? And it just happens to be very similar. So how do you be sure that you're not violating someone else's copyright? Well, the the good rule of thumb is if you didn't create the original thing yourself, mm-hmm. then go get permission or don't use it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there are a few little exceptions to that, but, but generally speaking, but you, you know, in the situation you're talking about where one artist is accused of copying another artist, uh, melody or something like that. Right now there's a big case going on, um, involving Ed Sheeran 
and uh, uh, the estate of, of a, a guy I used to represent, actually. Oh, who, uh, Celebration, right? The Celebrate song, I think? Is that no, a- it's, it's – um, oh, what's the name of the title, the title of the song? Anyway, the, <laughs> it was one of the Marvin Gaye songs as well oh. as a claim to be copied uh, in uh, – is it thinking out loud? Is that oh the right, right, song? right? Okay, yeah, I was saying genre. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, mm-hmm. and Era. anyway, mm-hmm. so the accusation is that Sheeran used the melody from this Marvin Gaye song that yeah. my client, my old client, had had written, you know, back in the sixties. Yeah, and so there, the the trial comes down to: are the protected components of the song, the original song, uh, the excuse me, the new song, are they substantially similar to mm-hmm. what's protected in the old song? Mm-hmm. And then. That's a question for a jury to decide. Usually they end up hearing a lot of experts and listening to the songs side by side. And and um, uh, then they have to decide, is it substantially similar or something less? And if it, if it is, then that's yeah. infringement. So I guess you just try to create things as originally as possible. Have the fountain be yourself first, which well, I'm sure just got really complicated with ChatGPT. And that's a whole nother, <laughs> that's a whole nother ball well, of Well, that's wax. interesting, actually. Yeah. The ChatGPT and, and the whole... You know, we're hearing about AI generated music now mm-hmm. and leaving aside some questions about whether or not it's OK to make it sound exactly like Drake. And right the in the in the likeness of right, mm-hmm. right. Um, the, the writing of a song is something that a computer can't own a copyright. So if you hear one of those AI generated things, uh, you might be able to use that. But the best advice I can say for creators is create it yourself. Hire someone to create it for you or buy it from someone who has created it and buy it, meaning just get a license, get permission to do what you want to do, negotiate a deal. Don't be afraid of the word royalties. It just means the amount you pay to the creator for something. It could be a one-time fee. It could be a per episode or, you know, just dollars per second of music or, or whatever. But, um, it is possible to make those deals and, and use the music you want if the, artists and, and owners of the material are willing. So, yeah. And, and not to take too deep of a dive into, into this area, cause it wasn't really something I intended, but it's, it's, it is very topical and important on people's minds right now. And yeah. I kind of want to flip something around that you, that you just said. So yeah. if you are basing copyright on when you create something, the copyright basically exists at that moment. Yeah. So if, as people are starting to explore the uses of chat GPT and AI in their own production process in their own creation process just be careful because the i am assuming then if i'm kind of deconstructing the reconstruction what you're saying that if you utilize chat gpt and ai there's there's a threshold you might cross over where it's no longer considered your original work and you might not be able to copyright that or claim it and right so yeah. the, the copyright office just in the last few weeks has made the ruling that in order to be entitled to the protection of copyright law the author has to be human <laughs> it's not actually that. not a new ruling there there have been cases but they just said okay in case y'all didn't know <laughs> yeah well i mean you know there were cases sure. involving the elephant and the paintbrush in the trunk oh right yes and there were some monkey selfie photo images a few years ago <laughs> yes i remember that does the monkey own the selfies i remember that yeah right, yeah right. yeah oh so uh the, the ruling was no nobody owns those images they're free to use and uh and that's the same that will happen with an ai created song now mm-hmm. again Again, if the song, if the prompt says write a song that sounds exactly like this artist and you know and is a, a similar to that song, then it may still be infringing. It just who do you sue? Right. <laughs> so, right. Right. Um, right. Well, the answer is you sue the person who's using it, mm-hmm. even though nobody actually owns the copyright in it. That's and so, it, so it, it, this is going to get tricky. This is going to get tricky. So okay, so like to cap it in simplicity because it can't get really tricky. If mm-hmm. something is created. The moment is created. If it's created by a human, there's a copyright. If it's created mm-hmm. by a non-human, it's open use, generally speaking. Yes. Okay, good. Yay, we nailed it down. All right, so <laughs> similar train of thought, though, for trademark. Yeah. How? What do you need to do to protect your own trademarks in terms of your podcasting? So trademark, you adopt a distinctive title mm-hmm. for your show, mm-hmm. which means it shouldn't be just descriptive of what you get. Right. My own show, this is a do as I say, not as I do situation. <laughs> my, ty- my One of my shows is called Entertainment Law Update. It tells you exactly what you're getting when you tune in and listen to the show. Right. So it's very descriptive. Right. So it was not entitled to trademark protection when we first started the show because it wasn't distinctive enough. Mm. It wasn't making the Too connection. Too generic. And, 
in the exact well generic is at the further end of the spectrum from right. generic to dis, to descriptive to suggestive and fanciful all the way over to coined phrases words like xerox that have no gotcha. real meaning in the world so you know choose choose a name that is sort of more than merely descriptive mm -hmm. i guess i would say mm -hmm. and then launch your show, get a couple of episodes out and then register a trademark. I think it makes a good sense to do it. It's not cheap. It's not super expensive, but it's not cheap. Uh, if you're a do it yourself or it can be done for in the neighborhood of $350. If you can do it right. Um, that this is one of the areas where people come to me and say, well, I tried to register and I got this rejection thing and I, now I need help. And, um, and, and there's that, but having a lawyer do it can be quicker, but that protection puts you in a position to tell anybody else who comes along and adopts the same or a similar title, Hey, stop it. Mm -hmm. And you can tell the directories that's mine. Make, you know, take them down. Don't, right. don't carry the show. And, uh, I have a few clients who, you know, they have show titles that are interesting enough that it catches the imagination. And there's one that I think last time I searched, there'd been 45 different shows that started up with similar titles that we've had to send. Usually we send a letter and that's the end of it. But Wow. Yeah. So if I remember correctly, it goes with both the name, but it can also apply, as you mentioned, with, with well, the I, show think you, I think you mentioned logo. with Mickey Mouse, you mentioned the trademark and the copyright. So yeah. with the, it can be the symbol, right, of, mm -hmm. of your logo or of, of your... It's a symbolic identity for you. Like with Horses in the Morning, one of my clients, you know, Glenn the Geek very well, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, their logo has that horse on it. Um, mm -hmm. For example, that's trademarked. So yeah. that kind of a thing can be trademarked as well. So it's the name, it's the symbol. What else am I not thinking of? Well, I mean, like I said, it could be the name, it could be the symbol, the logo, it could be the artwork, the whole artwork. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. It could it could also be the the phrase or the title of a segment of your mm. show. Oh, interesting. If you remember back in the okay. day, David Letterman had the guy under the stairs. You know, that segment was something that was both copyrighted and a trademark for ah, for the brand. So interesting. Um, yeah, those kinds of things can can be protected. And then again, you spending money to protect things, you got to decide is it worth it. <laughs> right, right. And yeah. and so when you're doing it on your own, there's a there's some, you know, I man, even lawyers need lawyers, right? You because the law is so vast that you get really dialed in and, and knowledgeable on a very specific area typically, and so lawyers yeah. need lo lawyers themselves. So sometimes even they have these questions about what gets mm -hmm. trademarked, what gets how. The, so a question for you: if you're if you're trying to do it on your own, there's a lot of. Mm -hmm pitfalls you might accidentally fall into. Here's one that I heard about. Here are two that I heard about, and I just wanted your opinion on. One is when you're trademarking a symbol, mm -hmm. it's better to try to trademark it as, as grayscale, black and white tones, rather than specify the color. Is that true? Generally speaking, yeah, because mm -hmm. you know you might decide to change your your color scheme at some point. You don't want to have to go back and re-register for the new color scheme. So, if the design itself can be done in grayscale, and and frankly, the part of the reason this is the case is that the uh, the Federal Register, which and the, and the official Gazette of the Trademark Office, where these things are shown and published is published in black and white. <laughs> so <laughs> they actually use um, there's a whole mechanism for different cross hatching marks to indicate different color schemes and things. But the grayscale is usually or or just line art is is good. Gotcha. So. Okay. Okay. And so then the other the other thing I heard, um, which in my opinion is just a rumor until I hear it from you <laughs> is that if you create a logo in Canva, that that cannot be trademarked because the elements um they, they can't be trademarked. Is that they're already owned something like that. Is that true? I have, I have once before heard that statement and I don't necessarily agree. Okay. I think that it is possible to take the elements that are in Canva and develop it into something that is itself distinctive. It's the, but it's the combination of those elements. No, you couldn't just grab a logo design from them, you know, a circle with a banner through it right. and a flag or something that would be not distinctive because there's others out there using similar stuff. Sure. But when you start to overlay it and create a more composite thing, then I think that could be distinctive to you okay. and therefore registrable. All right. So just to make sure I've covered my bases again, I know we could take super deep dives into so many things, mm -hmm. but in the just this area of copyright and trademark, have I forgotten to ask anything critically important? 
<laughs> you haven't asked the, the magic question that I always get about fair use. Ooh, yes, yes, yes. So fair use is what everybody thinks they understand and very few people, including, you know, the lawyers don't always understand it fully. What I can tell you about fair use is that it's not a good idea to rely on it as the excuse for not getting permission to use a copyrighted work. Mm -hmm. It is a defense in copyright infringement lawsuits so that someone sues you. And you might have this argument that, well, what I did was fair use. It's, it's, it's in the greater public interest to allow this kind of thing to happen because here we're in the U.S. we have the First Amendment, freedom of speech. Well, you have a law that says – excuse me, you have a constitutional provision that says Congress shall make no law that abridges freedom of speech. And on the other hand, you have a Congress making a law that says you can't make copies of that thing. Right, right. <laughs> so <laughs> the courts had to develop this approach to balancing out – the public interest and the kinds of uses that we believe should be allowed, educational criticism and commentary, parody, those kinds of things, uh, because that's, you know, it's that's about advancing speech and and social interest against the more commercial, more uh, purely expressive kinds of works. Then you have uh, uh, the, anyway, there's four factors, the purpose and character of the use, the nature of the original, how transformative is this new use. Uh, the third factor is the amount and substantiality. And that's where one of the big misconceptions, I'm only using eight bars of music. Or right. Two seconds of seconds, it. Right, right. Yeah. That's not the real test. The test is how substantial is what you took relative mm -hmm, to the whole mm -hmm. thing. Because sometimes you can point out a song by just hearing two seconds of it. Yeah, I mean, if Beethoven was copyright protected, it would be bum, 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 bum. Right, that's, that's all you need. <laughs> <laughs> bum, right. bum, 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 bum. <laughs> so, and then the fourth factor is the um, the impact or, or yeah, the effect or impact on the market for or value of the original. And that's where this other misconception, well, I'm not making any money from it, comes mm. from. That's not the test. The test mm -hmm. is, did you affect the market or the abil ability of the owner right. to make money from it? Right, did you their impact, their ability? Yeah. To, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So we balance all four of those, and each case has to be handled on its own. There's no rules of thumb, no guidelines to go with other than, you know, maybe if it's a movie review and you use a you know, two second snippet from a scene in the movie, that's probably fair use. But, mm -hmm. um, we lawyers are, we lawyers who do this are asked for these opinions all the time and we have right. to hedge. We just can't say for sure. Right. Right. You can't say for sure until honestly, all the pieces of that particular case are laid out and not for nothing. You know what side you're on. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, and, and the point is that the cost of that defense, if you get that far, is tremendous. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars to defend yourself in a copyright infringement That's suit. True. So discretion is a better part of valor. Avoid it if you can. <laughs> so let's all exercise discretion, caution, um, overabundance or not. Let's all be smart and contact Gordon. So Gordon, how can people find, follow, and contact you so they can make sure they're getting the best of the best of the best of the best advice in terms of the legalities of podcasting? Well, there are two URLs I'll give you. One is just gordonfiremark.com. That is where I have some courses and templates and those kinds of things all available for sale. And then if you're interested in talking to me on a one-on-one -on -one kind of a thing, go to thepodcastlawyer.com. And you can follow me on social, <laughs> G Firemark. Awesome, awesome. And I'll put all those links in the show notes so everybody can find them very, very easily. Great. Gordon, it has been a pleasure speaking with you. I unabashedly going to ask you to come on <laughs> again at some point and go down we, another rabbit hole with me. We've only the surface of the various legal things that can come up. So I'd so be delighted true. to come so back true. again. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Gordon. Have a great one. Great to be with you, Jenny. Oh my gosh. Like I said, I wanted to hold this conversation because I did not want this very valuable information to fall through the cracks and get overlooked if I put it on in a fairly silent week. So I'm so glad that I held it and that you got to listen to this this week when I can go like at the top of the hills and bang the drums and say, everybody listen to the Podcast Lawyers episode because it was phenomenal and so crucially important. If you want to have your independent voice matter and last forever and own your content, you need to be able to protect your assets through proper copywriting and trademarking. If you don't, you can end up really, really getting bit in the butt. So you don't want to do that. And also, I think it's interesting when you think about the flip side, it makes it very curious, especially in the terms of AI and all that. What's the future hole for this landscape? It's going to be very interesting. And in my opinion, not so humble, it just means 
another excuse to keep inviting Gordon back over and over and over again to share the microphone with me because he is so brilliant and also a really, really good human. So if you need a lawyer, definitely, definitely, definitely (laughs) reach out to Gordon. All his info is in the show notes. Okay, so now let's end with one more of my daily tips. And be sure, again, to subscribe to me on social media. That's TikTok, Instagram, Clapper, YouTube, um, Twitter. I'm forgetting some other things, but follow, follow me there and you'll get all these tips and you'll get them first. And uh, if you email me at jemmy, J-A-I-M-E, at flintstonemedia.com, you can ask me to give you a tip on a certain topic or cover a certain topic on a future episode. And I want to be able to serve you. So be sure you contact me. And And if the show is helping you grow your show, let me know about that too. Because on podcastingyourbrand.com, there's now a space where I can add a click through of your show art that'll lead right to your episode or your show. So if on my website, if you want that free space and exposure, just let me know that this show is helping you out. I'll put you right there. So that is it for now. This is producer Jemmy signing off. Remember, the only thing more powerful than your voice is your spirit to use it. So turn that mic on. Hey, it's producer Jemmy with your tip for today, continuing to focus on finding great guests. Now, it can be such a joy, whether you find them online or in person or whatever, to find a really great guest that you want to have on your show. But here's the thing, that really great opportunity for really amazing guests can quickly sour and bite you in the butt if you don't do this. What is it? Oh my God, it's like the easiest, simplest thing ever go to Google and Google their name and quickly figure out, is there anything in their background you don't want to be associated with, right? Are there any red flags? Is there any controversy surrounding them and their brand that you don't want to be associated with you and your brand? Look for those red flags before you have them on and come back here every day for more tips, podcastingyourbrand.com. I'm producer Jenny. Flintstone Media has been building brands through the power of podcasting since 2014, serving as an award-winning and highly resourceful podcast production house and consultancy firm. Work with producer Jemmy, a leader in the podcast industry, and add a new podcast to your brand's content offerings. From show development and setup through recording and distribution, producer Jemmy and her team will lend their experience launching dozens of successful podcasts and producing thousands of episodes, making creating your show a simple and easy turnkey process for you. Visit FlintstoneMedia.com for podcast samples. That's FlintstoneMedia.com.